we're going to talk about family, and in this series we're talking about real families. Brother, you can help us out with this. Uh, some of you have, you have your, your carefully posed family pictures, and then you have real pictures of your family. We have a photo booth out there too, you can create your own, but uh, if you have some of those pictures, we've had several of you share things. Uh, email those in to the church office. You can send it to anybody on staff, whatever's easiest for you to get it to us. But send us your real family pictures. We'd like to use those in the course of the uh, series. Now, when it comes to families, we know families can take on a lot of different looks. And uh, some of the families that are most familiar to us are the ones that we're about to see. And we're going to play a little game here. A family game. This is a very generational game we found in the first hour. Let me show you a picture. There's a family. Okay, so what family is that? Last name? Douglas, thank you. My three sons. How many of you had no idea who those people were? Yeah, that's the way. We had a lot of people in the first hour. Oh, who in the world is that? Okay, this next one. Okay, that's a... That's, that's a very special family. That is the, 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 the Munsters. And uh, we had a lot of controversy about this because a lot of people thought Adam's family in the office. Uh, uh, but obviously, that's not the Adam's family. Completely different family. This is the Munsters. Okay. Next family. What's the show? Family Ties. Yes. It's about a... A couple that grew up in the 60s, some you know, kind of hippies and uh, way on the liberal side of all things, and, and they raise a very Republican, Michael J. Fox, somehow. <laughs> so that's the storyline of family ties. Okay, let's see. Next up, Malcolm in the middle. This is before Breaking Bad. Some of you may be more familiar with, but uh, yeah, that's... Uh, that is the Wilkerson's, if you didn't know their last name. It's only mentioned like in one episode. Okay, next up, we'll kick back a ways. The Ricardos, and this is I Love Lucy. Okay, next up. <laughs> okay, how many of you have no idea who those people are? Yeah, I figured that was very generational question there. That's family affair. What's unique about family affair is you have... Uh, Sissy, Buffy, and Jody being raised by their uncle and Mr. French, right? So this is a really different kind of family. Uh, okay, next up. Jefferson's. Jefferson's started out on another sitcom and uh, spun off and had a pretty long run. Here's another one for you. Oh, happy days. And it's the Cunninghams. Next up. It's the same response as we got in the first. Oh, I love that family. Yeah, full house. Those are the Tanners. Okay, next up, pretty easy. Yeah, primetime cartoon, the Flintstones. And the and thank you and the rubbles. We don't want to leave the rubbles out. I appreciate you uh, riding that ship. Okay, uh, next, kicking back. How many of you have no idea who that is? Again, generationally, that just divided. Uh, Father knows best. The Anderson family. Okay, you, for you younger crowd, this will help you out a little bit, maybe. Yeah, Family Guy, it's the Griffins. Okay, you should not live here if you don't know who these people are. Oh, that's the Ewings of Dallas. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, next up. Little House on the Prairie is a heartwarming tale about everything that can be horrible about living in the prairie in the old... <laughs> Always a new disease and a new disaster, heartbreaking every week. 
Okay, you know these people. In that photo, a tribute to the 70s, I, have, I, I did submit a picture, a family picture this week for our little submit a picture. I am, I am this guy uh, in this picture. It's me and my parents and my sister, and uh, it pretty much lines up with the Brady Bunch. Okay, here we go. Okay, so Amazon Prime is carrying all of these now. So last night, on the rainy night, I watched the first three episodes of the Beverly Hillbillies. Now, here is, these are the Clampets, of course. Now, but again, you have a single father with a daughter. You got granny and you got a nephew, Jethro. So again, a little non-traditional family. But it was interesting because how many of you can sing the whole Beverly Hillbillies song? A lot of those old, I'm not going to make you, thank goodness, I'm not going to make you. But you, you'd burned a hole in your brain because you heard it every week. It was so catchy. But in the early episodes, they said they're, they're continuing with the same tune. And as they drive the truck down uh, Bel Air, wherever they are, they're heading for Beverly Hills, there's a big sign that says Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And it's singing the same song. And it, it's singing about how... Uh, and this week's sponsor is Kellogg's Corn Flakes. And anyway, I'd never caught that. That was free, by the way. The first service didn't get that. Okay, next up. There you go. Leave it to Beaver. Beaver Cleaver. There you go. Okay, this one's uh, just for me, maybe. The Bluth family. Thank Who said Bluth family? Thank you for that. That's the Bluth family, and that is Arrested Development, available on Netflix. Okay. Uh, here we go for you uh, classicals. Downton Abbey. Yes. Downton Abbey, the Crawley family. Okay. The Waltons, just as, as now that Little House on the Prairie is uh, over here, we have the Waltons over here to tell you all the things that can go bad in the Depression. So uh, this is the Walton family. Then we have this guy. We love him. Everybody loves Raymond. Yeah, the Barone family. Okay, here's your one. Okay, how many of you have no idea who that is? Okay, several of you. Okay, Amazon Prime has every episode of Petticoat Junction available to you, so you can... But again, you have, you have Kate down there in the bottom. She has three daughters, who sometimes uh, are different girls as the seasons go on. And uh, that's Uncle Joe. He's uh, moving kind of slow at the junction. Yeah. Okay, again, a uh, uh, very memorable song. Next up. Hey, welcome back to the 70s. The Partridge Family, single mom, five singing kids, and a creepy manager. <laughs> then, All in the Family, yes, and this was a highly controversial show in its time, and still today if you go back and watch it, The Bunkers of All in the Family. And this is just for you current folks. Oh, when does the next season start? that we can see the trials and tribulations of the Pearsons, because this is us. Okay. You did pretty good. This is just an exhibition. It's not a competition, so please, no wagering. That's a disclaimer. Okay. Why are so many TV shows, whether it's a drama or it's a sitcom, why are, why are they built around families? Because we relate to families, that's why. Because we're all in a family, and we know the trials and tribulations of family. And when they play out these different scenarios in these TV families, you feel it. Because you say, well, that's not too far off from people I know or from how I have lived life. And we connect with their stories. The Bible is largely a story about families. Of all the things that we say about God's Word, it's a story about families. And that begins with Adam and Eve, the very first family. And it moves on. And you, you end up with that family of Abraham. And God says, I'm going to carry forward my great plan for 
time and eternity through a family. Uh, one of the reasons I encourage you, always read the Old Testament. <laughs> I know that Old Testament can be a harder, harder sledding for you uh, Bible readers than the New Testament sometimes. But the Old Testament is great because it's filled with family stories. <clears throat> Excuse me. Family stories. Because families are close to God's heart. And they're his idea in the first place. Now we see in the Bible that family problems are nothing new. Because from the time with Adam and Eve that sin came into the world, families have been under assault at a lot of diff- from a lot of different angles. Satan wants to destroy families, and he wants to scramble that. And really, the people we love most, family, often the ones we fight with the most. And the Bible doesn't gloss over the sins and the struggles and the shortcomings of family. And we see it from... Here's Adam, and here's Eve, and they sin in the garden, and what does Adam do? He just throws his poor wife under the bus. He's supposed to be there. We say, oh, you know, Eve made the choice, but it says, and then she gave the fruit to her husband, with, who was with her. He's standing idly by, and he puts all the blame on Eve, and I think they had a tough time recovering from the marriage things wrapped around that. We see plenty of sibling rivalry, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau. Joseph and his brothers, jealousy among wives. Uh, we have these families that, you know, God said, for this cause eventually, leave his father and mother, unite with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But it got more complicated when they started taking on the culture around them, started practicing polygamy. And then you end up with oddly blended families uh, where these wives are jealous of one another and their negative consequences that come with it. You find... Uh, a woman named Hannah who is unable to have a child and she prays for that child, but she's still in this tension with uh, the other wife of her husband. We find it with Leah and Rachel. You have uh, people like Eli and Samuel, David, who have children who just make adult children who make choices and just go way off the deep end and, and breaks the heart of their parents. You have Hosea who experienced such depth of pain in his relationships uh, with his relationship with his wife, marital difficulties. And in each of these cases, these relationships are damaged by sin. There's a broken world. And you, you add to it that, okay, these folks are making choices, doing dumb things, choosing sin. But then there's war and there's famine and there's a world that's still swirling around family that just adds some dynamics that just make it that much harder to do family and to do it well. And that's true then, that's true now. Much of the Bible is about families because God created the family to accomplish His great purposes in the world. And that's what we call our church a family. We're a family of believers and sometimes it's hard to do family of believers inside the walls of a church. Same reason. You spend a lot of time together and you start rubbing each other the wrong ways. Those one another's get hard and grace is hard to come by. Forgiveness can be hard to come by. But God's caring forth in families the gospel and his plan of sharing his love with a lost world. Now I want to spend some time with one particular guy from the Bible. And he's an important guy in the Bible because... As Moses, he, he, he is recording Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five, first, first five books of the Bible. Moses is writing that stuff down for us. And he gives Genesis 37 through Genesis 50 to this guy, Joseph. Now, that's a big chunk of Bible dedicated to a guy. And so we're going to look at Joseph today. And I want to give you just a summary of his life. And then we're going to spend some time reading the summary of his life. So Joseph is a guy, and he is born into a family where he is one of 12 brothers. Mama's, uh, and this is a blended family too, so there's that dynamic. But 12 boys living in Canaan. Their father is Jacob. He's going to be renamed. The Lord renames him Israel. He is a key guy. He's the father of what becomes the 12 tribes of Israel. He's a strategic, fa- this is a strategic family, and Joseph is a strategic guy in it. Here's what happens. Uh, Joseph is born late in that game, next to the youngest son. And maybe, because, maybe because it's the son of his old age, Jacob just favors 
Joseph a little more than the rest. He, maybe he raises him a little more like a grandparent would raise a child than a parent would raise a child. A little more permissive, a little more favoritism. And uh, it just gets, gets kind of scrambled because his brothers don't miss this. They notice that dad's showing a lot of favoritism. Dad gives him, among other things, this multicolored coat. Well, in a world that's largely black and white, a third world environment we would call it today, it was expensive to dye and all that. He, he makes him this beautiful coat and gives it to him. And it, it's like, and he wears it too. So it's like a banner to the brothers. Dad likes me better than you knotheads. Now he's, he's also, he's not above uh, stoking the fire himself. And so one of the things we find with Joseph, he's a teenager and he, he knows he's a step up from his brothers. And, and so there's some stories in there about Joseph going out and he come back to dad and saying, you know, what, you know what my brothers are doing? They're goofing off. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. And he rats them out to dad and gets them in trouble. They don't appreciate that either. Then he has a series of dreams. Okay, these dreams. He tells the dream. Well, what it means is obvious even to his knothead brothers. One day, you guys will all bow down before me. Okay, that sold really well back home. Yeah, you guys are all going to bow down and I'm going to be Lord over you guys. So one day, his brothers are off a good ways from, from home and uh, taking care of flocks. And dad says, go check on the boys. So Joseph loads up, puts on his multicolored coat. And he takes off to go check on his brothers. and They see him coming at a distance and they're thinking, okay, we're a long way from home. This is our shot. We've had just about enough of this. We've been putting up with it for his whole life. And here's what we're going to do. Let's kill him. Well, one of the older brothers talked him down from that. Oh, let's not kill him. That's going too far. That's crazy. Dad never forgives. So instead, they sold him. I don't know what sibling rivalry, look, rivalry looks like in your family, but you probably never sold a sibling into slavery. But they did. They sold their brother to a caravan. Uh, traveling along, sold him, made a little money on the deal. Then they took that multicolored coat, put some goat's blood on it, took it back to dad and said, I guess a wild animal killed him. Dad's devastated. Meanwhile, Joseph, he gets hauled off. These guys uh, resell him and uh, they sell him to a guy named Potiphar. He's an Egyptian uh, military guy, pretty important fella. They sell him to Potiphar, and here's the thing about Joseph, God blesses him, even though, okay, my brothers have sold me into slavery, now I'm in Egypt, a long way from home, and everything that I know, but God blesses him, and he makes good choices, and he seeks to honor the Lord, and do what is right before God, and he gets elevated to, he's over Potiphar's whole household, he's, he's managing the estate, it's, a, it's an important guy, and it's an important estate. And he's managing everything. Everything's going pretty good. Maybe this isn't so bad after all. Potiphar has this wife, and she's seeing this young, handsome guy. She tries to seduce him, but he can't. He's going to do what's right. I am not. I am going to honor my master Potiphar. I'm not going to. But she continues to pursue him and pursue him till finally he just. Uh, the, in the New Testament, we're told to flee temptation. That's what Joseph did. He just ran the other way as fast as he could go. And then she accused him of molesting her. Potiphar was furious hearing this story from his wife, all fabricated. And so he has him thrown into prison. So now Joseph, like it's not, everything's not bad enough. My brothers sell me in as a slave. And I'm, I'm in this guy's household. Then now, now I'm in prison and everything's rotten in my life. And family, nowhere to be found, all alone, a foreign land. So he's in prison. Well, again, he makes the right choices. He's going to honor God. He's going to, wherever he is, he's going to make the most of that opportunity. Well, then he, he gets put over the whole prison. There's just the prison, the head prison guy says, you take care of everybody. You're, you're, you're doing a great job. And he manages the prison. He's doing well. A couple of high-ranking officials close to Pharaoh, they get, they get in trouble. It's not hard to get crossways with Pharaoh, apparently. And he boots them out, puts them in prison. They're in prison with Joseph. Joseph starts talking to him. He's taking care of them. And then they have a couple of weird dreams, and Joseph interprets the dreams. 
And they come out exactly the way that Joseph said they would. But for two more years, he's still in prison because the one guy whose dream came out pretty well on his end, he forgot to uh, let, let somebody know, hey, this guy probably shouldn't be in prison. But after a couple of years, Pharaoh himself has a crazy dream. What in the world does this mean? It has him all freaked out. If he's freaked out, everybody's freaked out. Then this official says, oh, wait a minute. There was a guy, I really messed up. There was a guy that interpreted a dream for me and I was supposed to do him a favor because he'd done me such a favor and tell me about the dream. Uh, he can interpret dreams. So Pharaoh yanks Joseph out of prison. They hose him off, clean him up, put some new clothes on him, bring him into Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, here's my dream. And Joseph listens to the dream and says, my God can help out with this. Let me tell you, here's what it means. The next seven years are going to be fantastic. Economy is going to be great. Food production off the charts. Everything is going to be wonderful in this country. Then... There are going to be seven years where it's all going to be bad. In fact, it will devastate lives, devastate the land. And so, you know, you might think about finding somebody who could make the most of those seven years and store stuff up, or else the, the second seven years are going to wipe us out. And Pharaoh says, I think I know just the guy for the job. And all of a sudden, the guy who was in prison the day before, is now second in command over all of Egypt. Joseph is put in charge of making the most of the seven years of plenty to prepare for the seven years of devastation. Well, the devastation didn't just, uh, didn't just go to Egypt. It made its way around the ancient Near East. And before long, Dad, back in Canaan, Jacob says, Boys... I hear they have food in Egypt, and if we're going to survive in the, in the devast now they're in the devastating years, we're going to have to go to Egypt and get some food. So take some money, some things to trade, go get us some food. They go, and they have to appear before Joseph to ask for food. Now, it's been 20 years. Joseph was a, maybe 17 years old when they sold him off. 20 years later, he looks a lot different. Plus, he's all garbed out in Egyptian stuff. He doesn't look anything like a... Hebrew uh, shepherd anymore. And uh, here they come. Joseph recognized them immediately. And he does several things to test them, to challenge them, and more than a little bit to yank their chain. I, I got to believe. I think he, he wasn't completely pure in all of his motivations about what he was doing with these guys. Uh, he, made, he made life hard for them and uh, really scared the bejeebers out of them. That's a Hebrew word. <laughs> well, they have food. They come back. There's a lot of back and forth in this relationship. Joseph still concealing his identity from his brothers. But finally, he reveals himself to him. I'm Joseph. And I forgive you for all the, all the stuff you've done to me. Because God had a different plan. And he, he says... Go, go tell dad I'm alive. Bring the whole family here. I can take care of you in Egypt a whole lot better than I can do this long distance. So Jacob brings the whole family and they come down to Egypt. Uh, Joseph makes sure they have the best of the land. They uh, are now going to be okay. They have the full support of Pharaoh and all this. And when Jacob died, Joseph and his brothers... Uh, it's an elaborate funeral, and then they go and take, take Dad back to the land of Canaan, the land of promise. He's buried there, and it's a big to-do. And then they all head back to Egypt again, and Joseph says something a little prophetic. He says, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. You're not going to remain in Egypt forever. We're all supposed to be back in the promised land, and God's not done with us yet. And so in the Exodus, when Moses loads everybody up and they're all leaving Egypt, one of the things they do is they take with them the bones of Joseph that one day he will be buried again in the land of his fathers. Okay, this is just the story of Joseph and his family. 
uh, his wonderful family in so many ways. God's a part of everything and every day. We see God's hand moving in the worst of circumstances. But here's what we find in this one family. It's a quick summary. He was born into a blended family. Some of you know the challenges of blended family life. Parent playing favorite with the kids. Kids being well aware of playing favorites at whatever age. Pridefulness in the favored child. He enjoys embarrassing his brothers before dad. They want to even the score. They sell him into slavery. Fake his death. His father is broken hearted over the loss of his favored son. Joseph is a long way from home. He is, he is all alone and he's wondering why. Why? What is God up to in this? I'm doing the right things. I'm making good choices. And yet everything just keeps going worse and worse. His brothers, we find out later on, they're still carrying guilt of the last 20 years. This is all, the reason all these bad stuff's happening to us is because of the dumb thing we did with Joseph. Dad is still just wrecked by his grief. And some of you have experienced deep grief and loss. There's famine, there's crisis, desperation. Joseph gets a little revenge, uh, tests out these brothers a little bit, and the family is finally reunited and rescued, and God gets all the credit for it. That's just this family. Genesis chapter 50, verse 15, picks up the story when Jacob had died. Here's what it says in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Oh, they're afraid. Oh, he was just holding off because dad was around. Now, there's nothing to stop him from getting his revenge. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. How many of you think he made, they made that up? Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph hears what they say. And this Likely just a story they concocted and it says jo Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And his brothers also came and they fell down before him and said, Behold, we're your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them, spoke kindly to them. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. And he can take something so broken as this family and he can make it beautiful because that's what God does with families. Families can be the source of our greatest joys and our, and our greatest sorrows and hurts. From the same family come the most satisfying and the most maddening of experiences. Uh, Dennis Miller wrote a book some years ago called Ranting Again. Maybe that should be our new, in the United States, our new uh, official song of our country, Ranting Again. And uh, in it, he talked about family, and he said, your family cut you the most slack. It's your family that give you the most chances. He says, when the quiz show host says, name something you find in a refrigerator... And you say, a dictionary. And the rest of America is screaming, you moron, at their TV sets. Who is clapping and saying, good answer, good answer. <laughs> it's your family. Yet, families can drive us crazy. I read this story as a woman, she said she's speaking to her nephew on the phone. She called, he started first year of college, I wanted to check in on him. And, and so she asked, so how are things going? What classes are you taking? And he said, I'm taking an intro to a psychology class. And she said, oh great, fall semester, now Thanksgiving, Christmas, you'll just be trying to analyze all of us. He said, no, 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 I don't take abnormal psychology until spring semester. You know how that goes. Robert Frost was wise when he wrote, Home is the place where, when you have to go there, they have to take you in. 
Families get into messes and marriages turn into war zones. and Family members make bad, destructive choices. And it may be with money stuff or sex or pornography or gambling or just honesty, harsh words, harsh actions. Some of you are deeply hurt in family things today. Some of you are angry about family things today. But you want family to work. You know it's God's plan. You know that somewhere in there, God is not done with you and your family just yet. And if that's going to be the case, forgiveness just has to be a big part of family. Grace has to be a big part of family because I know I have to give it freely because I'm going to need a lot of grace. And I'm going to need a lot of forgiveness on my end of things. Colossians, Paul's writing to a church family It's true for every family, too. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you. You must forgive others. Man, that starts at home. Now, starting over as family is tough. Beginning again after lots of hurt is hard in that extended family of things. And the longer you live, the more opportunity you have to build up a pretty uh, pretty good list of hurts. I was in college and I read this book and I heard this illustration for the first time and I've used it lots of times, especially in relationship to marriage, but it's true just for family stuff in general. It compared so much of what happens in families to uh, remodeling your house. And some of you have done, have, have stepped into the madness of remodeling your house while you're living in it and all the rights and privileges that come with remodeling your house while you're in your house. And it just compared to that and it said... Rebuilding your household is like remodeling a house. It will take longer than you planned. It will be messier than you anticipated. And it will cost much more than you thought. But here's the thing. With God's help, you can take what is a mess in family. And you can make, you can see all things become new. New beginnings, fresh starts, second chances is the nature of our God. I want to share a couple, of, because we're introducing this whole scheme of things. We have a lot of breakouts on this coming. Let me tell you a story. In the Old Testament, there's an unlikely story of a family who turned things around. Uh, how many of you like singing old songs at church? Okay, you sang a song today about as old as you're going to get. You sang a song from 1000 B.C. You don't even realize that's going to predate any old hymnal you got at home. It was the first song that we sang today. There was a guy in the time of Moses named Korah. And when God talked to Moses about how they were going to organize their worship, he said, okay, here's the deal. The tribe of Levi is going to be responsible for taking care of worship stuff. And there were different clans within the tribe. The descendants of Aaron were to be the priests. They were the ones that offered the sacrifices. They were the ones that went into the holy place. So that was the people of Aaron, the family of Aaron, brother to Moses. Those are the priests. But there are all these other clans within the tribe of Levi. And we see the same thing carrying over when David organizes the worship in the temple. Same clans, same kind of responsibilities. So, okay, Aaron and his family, they're, they're doing the big sacrificial stuff. But there are other tribes, like the family of Korah, they're responsible for just hauling stuff. Hey, we're going to break camp. God says break camp and move to the next location. They'd break camp, move to the next location. And the tribe of, uh, the clan of Korah, well, they'd help just to haul all that stuff that made up the tabernacle. When you get to the new, get to the time of David and the and then David hands things over to Solomon. Solomon builds the temple. David had already organized that all those clans would have the same kind of job responsibility with the temple. Aaron's family had the priestly responsibilities. Others did other things. Well, Korah, back in the time of Moses, he decided one day, I'm tired of being the guy that just hauls stuff. I'm as good a guy as Moses. I ought to have access. I ought to be... I ought to be in there offering sacrifices. Why, why did Moses and Aaron get to do all the cool stuff and I'm just hauling, hauling poles and curtains and all this? And Moses just steps back and says, well, let's put this in the hands of God. And what happens? 
Well, the ground opens up, swallows up most all of Korah's family who are rebelling against Moses and God's authority. But this is how God does things. He's a God of grace and love. And he doesn't destroy the whole family of Korah. And so you go forward generations. What's happened to the family of Korah? They have this, this mark against them just because of the family they're associated with. Well, by the time you get to the time of David, they're gatekeepers in the temple and they're singers in the temple. They're, they're writers of songs. And this is one of the songs the sons of Korah wrote. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Again, not, not in there in the temple where they're offering sacrifices in the holy place. Just out here in the courts. That's where, that's where the sons of Korah would function. In the outer courts. Better is, better is just one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. There came a day with the descendants of Korah that they just decided, we're going to break some patterns. We're going to change our heritage. We're going, to, we're going to chart a new course for our family. And we're going to finish well. When we talk about family, I think about Korah, his rebellion against Moses and against the Lord. I want to tell you, some of you are making choices today in your lives. And even now, you know it's just bad choices. And, and we'll break out a lot, of, uh, a lot of details because we're going to take on, over the next several weeks, just big challenges families face. But today, you know, this isn't a secret to you. You know you're making bad choices. I mean, you're having sex with somebody you're not married to. You're thinking about it. It's pornography. It's just eating away at your soul. you you're taking money from your employer and you know they're going to catch up with you. But right now, it feels like it's working for you. You're, you know, kids, we had a lot of teenagers in the first hour, high school students there. And, you know, I challenge them, you know, you just go in places and lie to your parents about it. The list goes on and on. But you know you're doing, doing something. You're taking a step. You, you've, over, you've dropped over some guardrails you should not have passed by. And you know there's some destruction ahead of you. And here's my question. If you continue on the path that you're on right now, and you know it's destructive, but it feels pretty good in the moment because we so much live in the moment. Like, well, it's all about right now. I'm not thinking about anything beyond how things are working for me and how things feel for me and what, what seems right to me in the moment. But where does the path lead you if you continue in the journey you're on right now? What does it look like when you get caught? You know, how do you... How do you explain an affair to your parents? How do you explain to your children that you lost your house gambling? How do you explain to your daughter at her wedding why you still can't sit on the same row with their mother? It's more than how you feel today. It's where does the road go? And where does it lead? And we have to feel the weight of, of our sin in its consequence. Another family, the family of Jeroboam and the path that Jeroboam set. So in 922 BC, Solomon dies. And when Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam became king. And he didn't take good advice. He, he took bad advice on how to be king over Israel. There was already quite a bit of tension because Solomon had fumbled the ball on several things toward the end of his life and made some bad choices himself. And so Rehoboam... He just does something dumb, and he's Judah, tribe of Judah, tribe of Benjamin. They stick with him down in the south, but the ten northern tribes, they just broke off and said, we're done with the house of David. Uh, you guys, uh, this is last straw. And the ten northern tribes break away, and Jeroboam becomes king over the ten northern tribes in 922 B.C., Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. This is Jeroboam the first. You know why we call him Jeroboam the first? Because there was a Jeroboam the second. It's really just kind of a math thing. Well, Jeroboam, 
he's king, and he actually, he's a strong leader. He had a whole lot going for him. There was a lot of spiritual background he had. You think, this guy might get the job done. But Jeroboam, he starts thinking logistically, and he says, okay, I mean, at least three times a year, all these people are supposed to go to Jerusalem for these big feast days. These people keep going down from my kingdom up here in the north, keep going down to the south to Jerusalem for the feast days. Their hearts are going to be pulled away from me. I need to create an alternative to going to Jerusalem. So he built places of worship in Dan, way up in the northern part of Israel, and in Bethel, down his southern part of his territory. Dan and Bethel, and he, he, he made some golden calves and put them at both locations and appointed his own priests, not Levites, not from the tribe of Levi, just guys. And here's what happens. The northern kingdom just begins to unravel as a result of it. There are 19 kings in the south, 19 kings in the north. And the kings in the north, if you read books like First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, which are also big family books, you read those books and the, the kings are always evaluated. And they always said they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That's a good king. They did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. That's a bad king. In the northern kingdom, all of them were bad kings. And the reason they're evaluated as bad kings, it says, well, they didn't do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. And in the north, the reason, they followed in the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam created this legacy of destructiveness spiritually to the northern kingdom. What he did created generations so that over the next 200 years, they just continued to implode. So that in 722 B.C., God sends the Assyrians in. And the ten northern tribes are hauled off into exile to never be heard from again. And and they are done. And the reason that's given is a summary for the northern kingdom being destroyed. They followed what Jeroboam started. And it brought devastation. Now, don't tell me which way you were going. Everybody has a great, well, here's what I believe and here's who I am. Look down at your feet and see which way they're pointing in every choice you make because that tells you where you really are and where you're really going. Some, some of you, you think about this, you say, you know, God's important, but do you really value the things of God? And you say, well, not as much as I value my stuff, not as much as I value chasing my kids around and all the stuff they're doing, not as much as my own selfishness. We found that um, there was a study, another study came out last week. You've heard, the, you've heard all the stuff about over the last five years or so especially. There's a generation of young adults that are identifying as, what's your, what's your religious preference and what do you believe? And they say none, N-O-N-E, none. I got no, I got no religious interest, no religious preference. And we started digging down. Okay, we got to figure out why. That's a, that's a weird aberration that we haven't had before. What, why is that? So... Researchers start digging down. Survey last week affirmed again. Same thing that a couple more have affirmed in the last year. In digging down with those young adults, here's what they found. It really wasn't that important to my parents. Oh, we tipped our hat to it. But it really wasn't that burning in the heart of my parents to believe these things. So as a parent, you know, if you're, if you're a four spiritually, you're, you know, then the rest of the family is going to come in at a two or lower, probably. It's, it's, there's, there's going to be a flow. And obviously, obviously, kids and grandkids, they're going to make their own choices. And sometimes, regardless of goodness, God was a perfect parent and he produced some sinful children with Adam and Eve. And so, those things are certainly always possible. But for some of you, you've been on a path for a while. Family's pretty scrambled, and what if your generation was the one that breaks the cycle? What if you're the one that says, I can't change everything that has been in my family. I can't, I can't touch all, but starting today, it's just going to be different. We're going to make the things that God says are important. We're going to make those things important to us. And we're going to go forward in a way that really brings God glory. We're going to trust Him for this, believing that that commitment still ripples out at whatever stage of life uh, and whatever roles 
your extended family uh, is in. Now, that's tough because we live in this time of self-indulgence and selfishness and ethical relativism, which is a bad combination. Uh, I read the book of Judges last week, and the Bible says two, a couple different times, beginning and end of that book, people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Oh, wow. No right, no wrong, no, uh, no good, no bad. It's just whatever works for you. You know, that's, that's the way to go. Do you know how to get out of jury duty? Not that you just don't care. I mean, I've served on juries before. Although typically, they say, so what do you do? And you get back to the question part. So what do you do? Oh, I'm the pastor at a Baptist church. Okay, thank you. You can go. Um, but I got pulled into the last 20 people on jury duty uh, a couple of years ago. And I go back, and we're sitting there in the, in the and, and we have the attorneys, and they're asking questions because they're trying to figure out who's going to work for them best. And the defense attorney, and it was a situation that uh, was very clear what had happened. So he's looking for a whole lot of who's going to give us a break here. And he says, now I know that, you know, in this time, we don't, none of you would say that things are black and white anywhere in the world. I mean, everything is really just a shade of gray. Wouldn't you all agree? I disagree, and we were, I was out. That was the end of me. So that's the way to get out of jury duty is uh, believe that there are things that are right and wrong in the world. They did not want that guy, apparently, uh, on the jury. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now, in the book of Judges, you have a lot of press given to a guy named Samson. Samson's a great guy, a big, strong guy, right? Here's what we get with Samson. He was raised by wonderful parents. But here's what we have about Samson. He drank too much. His sex life was out of control. His respect for God's plan for marriage was just ignored. He did not listen to the, parent, to the godly advice of his parents. And his life was a mess. And the guy with such great potential, uh, largely wasted. For a lot of real families, if you don't have moral absolutes, if you don't have secure boundaries of this is what's right and this is what's wrong, we're not stepping beyond that. Uh, good, bad, living right before God. Family's just going to be tough. And uh, listen, that's true whether your family is a big family and you're all wrapped up and close together. Uh, it's a big family living inside your house. Or it's just you living in a house by yourself with family scattered around. You're just going to have to have a solid foundation. You're familiar with this. Joshua ended his leadership of the Israelites with a speech. He already felt the reverberations of what was taking place. But at the end of his life... He challenged the people. He made a strong personal statement. of This is where I'm coming in. And this is my foundation. And he set it up as a choice to be made. And he's exactly right. We're all making choices. Every day we're making choices about what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. And, and consequences. And you have to make a choice. You know, why are things not working the way they're supposed to? Why does it feel like I can't get any traction in my life, in my family? And it may be just because the foundation hasn't been settled. So Joshua says... Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. Put away all those false gods, all those things you're putting your faith in besides the one true God. Serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the God your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. He said, just decide something. Quit, quit riding the fence. Just declare, I'm going all pagan all the time. Or decide, I'm going to be with the Lord all the time and all in. And he said, I can only tell you about me and mine. But as for me and my house, me and my family, we will serve the Lord. You know what happened next? A group of people skilled in crafts went and opened craft stores all over the world that had these plaques that said, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, and the rest is history. So, is that settled at your house? You say, oh yeah, it is, because you know, I went to the craft store and I have the plaque in my house, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. I'd probably be hard-pressed, and most of you, to get into your house and not find one of those on the wall. But that doesn't make it so. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. <clears throat> is that really true? I mean, we always do that thing, what's most important to you in your life? And you say, well, you know, number one's God, and number two is my family, and number three is whatever number three is. You know, for a lot of people, apparently it's Fortnite. So those are, those are your three things that are your most important things in your life. 
Is that settled at your house or is it negotiable from week to week, moment to moment? Are you hot and cold for God? You just need God's help to do this. I know I need God's help to do this every day. And you just invite him into your home. He's all about home and he's all about family. It's just a matter of including him in everything. These are hard times for families and it is time to engage and not give up. One of the things that happens is we say, well, I have my voice with my kids, my adult kids, my grandkids, my kids that live in my house. I have my voice, but it seems like I'm getting drowned out by all these other voices. I guess there's nothing I can do. We just throw up our hands in despair. Do not despair when the God who created the universe is at work. There is great hope for us in this, but you, you have to engage in the fight. There, there's a guy called St. Boniface. He lived in the 8th century. And I have kept this quote for 20 years next to my desk. And I read it on a regular basis. It inspires me in all kinds of different ways. It may or may not ring your bell. But he said, in a time when people are falling away from God, given up on the ways of God and the will of God. He said, let us stand fast in what is right and prepare our souls for trial. Let us be neither dogs who do not bark, nor silent onlookers, nor paid servants who run away before the wolf. Instead, where the battle rages, let us find ourselves there. Let us run toward the roar of the battle. That's where Christ's most glorious victories shall be won. Over these next few weeks, we're going to engage in the battle. We're going to throw in at every turn about hard things with family. You know, that ideal of my perfect family is an illusion. Family is hard. It's hard because Satan's going to oppose you. He's been, he's been going after family since he went after Adam and Eve. And we're not going to be an exception to that rule in this generation. We present our glamour shot images of our family on social media and pretend it's all good. But when people... When people ask, what does family really look like? What do we want family to look like? We need to answer well with a godly answer. So in the weeks ahead, uh, and I'm, I'm going to just about split this one down the middle with uh, Jimmy Smith because of his uh, family ministry background. But we're going to be exploring what the Bible says about the big problems we face as families. And some of these things are going to be close and personal and digging out and taking on big challenges is not easy. It's not ever easy. It's hard, but it's worth the fight. And that's the reason I, I began today with the story of Joseph. Because after all the crazy he went through, after all the brokenness within his family, and being so far from home for so many years, and then... then uh, they're several hundred years away from getting back to the promised land generationally. After they think revenge is coming, it's going to be bad now that dad's gone. He says, again, verse 19, do not fear for mine, the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people would be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I'll provide for you and your little ones. And thus he comforted them. Spoke kindly to them. We have great hope because it's not just me trying to be a better dad or a better husband, a better brother, a better son. It's about God's power coming to bear on all the circumstances of my life and my relationships. Same for you. It's just a reminder in this passage, the story of Joseph, that failure is not final in families. That God still fixes things that are broken and your real family is on God's heart, right where it is right now. And he has a great plan for you. To prosper you, to help you, to encourage you, to fix what is broken, what's been crushed, and where you feel overwhelmed. And God can make all things new and blessings flow. And it's all a matter of just pointing your feet in the right direction and taking a step. Let's see what God can do in the life of families in the life of our church family, when we just follow a good God plan.